All right, everyone. Welcome to Digital Conversations. I am your host, Billy Bateman. And today I am joined by a podcasting legend, John <laughs> Wall, partner at Trust Insights and co-host of Marketing Over Coffee. John, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me here, Billy. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm really excited for this, man. So uh, before we get into it, we're going to talk a lot about predictive analytics, attribution, you know, just, you know, your data cleanliness within marketing. But before we get into that, let's learn a little bit about you and, and what you do. So tell us about yourself and a little bit about your journey. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm a partner at Trust Insights, a marketing analytics firm. We say that we light up dark data, which is our, we're kind of data detectives. We help people figure out what's working in their marketing, what's not working, where to go next. Um, but my career path has been kind of crazy. I mean, as far as marketing tech, um, I've been in the startup world since about 97 and have gone through what this is like my seventh startup. Um, and we're actually three years in. I mean, we're well beyond startup phase, but I've kind of cycled through a number of times. And then before that, my background was actually economics. I graduated with a degree in econ. So I've always come at the marketing thing from the, you know, the quantitative and analysis side and, and tried to automate as much as possible. So, um, yeah, it's been a long, crazy path and a, a bunch of wild pit stops along the way. But uh, everything with Trust Insights is going well. And then... Uh, most of what we do at Trust Insights originally started when I was working with Christopher Penn. We started this podcast, Marketing Over Coffee, about it's going on like 15 years now. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, every week talk about marketing and tech, and that has just kind of finally gotten to a point where it uh, brings in clients for us for Trust Insights. You know, we have a reputation as knowing about and keeping an eye on what's going on and what's changing because this space is so crazy and dynamic. And uh, that has helped us build a community that we're able to kind of trade ideas with and uh, talk about what's going on with MarTech and it's, uh, it works well. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So you guys, you do a lot of work with predictive analytics and I mean, it's a nice buzzword. I don't think a lot of people really know, like, what does that, what does that amount to in the real world? So and I think let's let's just start there. So when you guys are talking about predictive analytics, like what are you looking at and what can you help people forecast? Yeah, the most common thing that we do for predictive um, is topic analysis. You know, we'll go take a look at um, grab a library of terms. Um, our chief data scientist, Christopher Penn, will run that against a number of models that he has. And so the most common example that we use, we have a blog post we update every year called the cheese report, where we look at all the cheeses in the market and we come up with a calendar for the next 12 months that says, okay, these are when specific cheeses are going to be hot and moving. And so as somebody who's creating content for a website, if you were in the cheese industry, you know, you know that come May and June, you better be teeing up all your content and videos about Halloumi. And I didn't even know halloumi was a thing until I read the cheese report. And as we dug in, it's a grillable cheese. So it always peaks in the summers when people are looking for halloumi recipes or want to buy halloumi. It's because they're getting ready to throw it on the grill in July and August. Mm -hmm. And so, and then, you know, as you keep digging into the data, you'll see mozzarella is on fire around Christmas time, uh, cheddar right around New Year's as everybody's doing parties. Um, Monterey Jack uh, comes in around the Super Bowl when people are making nachos. And so the idea is that by looking at all this data and looking ahead, you can predict the future and say, hey, we want to drop our content, you know, on these weeks because we know there's going to be demand the week following that. And, you know, we will have had content in place for a couple weeks before the surge hits. Um, you know, these models can be applied to anything. I mean, if you have enough sales data, you can look and say, you know, get an idea for maybe what your seasonal sales cycle will be. But we often find in B2B that there's just not enough data to really get effective yeah. models going. Um, but, you know, as far as like applying that same model to other stuff, women's shoes, we have a client that uses the women's shoes fashion report. So they know, you know, six to three months out from Black Friday, what's going to be hot in specific kinds of shoes and, and where to go. Wow. So um, it's, and it's gotten a little bit rough. Um, you know, it used to be rock solid. We could kind of generate models and they would just always be, you know, 95% greater confidence interval. You know, we would just know that yeah. it's pretty much certain, but COVID has kind of thrown a wrench in things. There's a, there's been a yeah. massive change in search behavior. And so a lot of markets have been messed up. So it's not as easy as it used to be. We used to kind of be able to say, yeah, we can definitely do that for everything. And now for a lot of projects, we'd say, well, we'll look, we'll go in there 
and we'll run some models and we'll get back to you if we think we can do some predictive because it's a lot more difficult than it used to be. Yeah. So with COVID, what what are you seeing as the changes in just consumer behavior um, since COVID? Yeah. You know, in one way, it's not radically different. Really, what people have been saying, some of the studies we've seen is that it's it's as if we just jumped five years ahead. You know, we've kind of been on this ramp of e-commerce is going in this direction and eating up yeah. more and more brick and mortar. And it's suddenly as if we just jumped ahead five years into the future because everybody now is forced to go online for purchases where there's this group of people who still like to go to, you know, the local big box store to buy stuff. And now they have no choice because of, you know, the toilet paper has gone or they don't want to go outside because yeah. they're at risk or whatever. So that's one thing. The other one that's kind of interesting is we've seen a lot of stuff that, web behavior, it's almost as if it's the weekend all the time. You know, we, we used to see very specific patterns in like Monday through Friday, there was all this B2B commercial traffic. Yeah. But then on the weekend, you know, that the commercial stuff is only 10 or 20% of the traffic. And yeah. then it was sports and Facebook and social and, you know, kind of messing around. <clears throat> and now it sort of looks like the weekend all the time because people don't have, you know, they don't go into the office where they maybe yeah. they can't even go to certain places or whatever, but it's people are now free to kind of roam where they want when they want to roam. And so it's, yeah, it's changed the open rates and the rules a little bit on a lot of stuff. Interesting. Okay. All right. So with, uh, to go along with predictive analytics, when you guys are talking about attribution and like, okay, this is something our marketing team, I'll hear them debate it. And sometimes I'll get in and sometimes I'm like, I'm not going to step in that today. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, how do we decide where somebody came from? And, you know, like, we, you know, was it the LinkedIn touch? Was it an email? Was it display ad? Like, how do we decide this is, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back and got them to purchase? Um, interested to hear what your opinions are and, and what you're seeing there. Yeah. So attribution modeling, yeah. It, it, I mean, you've kind of nailed it right at the heart in that it's, I mean, you're still tracking human behavior and everybody has these, yep. these um, situations where they're like, okay, yeah, it came from the white paper. You know, we saw and we came in from the white paper and then the person comes in, you know, a month later for a customer orientation and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I learned about you because George in accounting used to work for me six years ago, you know, and it has nothing yeah. to do, you know, everything gets ruined. And so, you, it's basically a best fit model. You know, you're kind of just always coming up with mathematical models or a procedure and seeing how close you can get to reality, knowing that you're just never going to nail it 100%. You can't get it right. Um, and so a big push as this initially grew was, you know, first it just started with source codes. It was just like, well, what was the last thing they did? Like, okay, we'll give them credit for that. And then of course you saw that it was like, it's always website, you know, like generic website is where they came from. Of course, nobody just comes to the website. They come from somewhere else to the website. Yep. Um, and then multi-touch attribution, you know, we finally got enough data to be able to handle that. And so we were able to say things like, well, we emailed them this white paper and then they came to the website. And so we can give, you know, 25% credit to email, 25% credit to the website. Uh, and then the math gets more advanced. Maybe you're saying, well, the last touch will give 80% to, and the first touch only gets 25. And some people would flip that. They're like, well, we're interested in acquiring new business. So we're going to put 80% at the first touch. And mm -hmm. then maybe you start to get really fancy and you do time decay, you know? So it's like, well, anything over a year, we don't really care about. Like if it yeah. was in the last nine months we care about. And so there's a bunch of different models. One thing that we've done that's unique to our attribution models is we use machine learning to just grab your entire data set. And so instead of having a formula, we just grab everything and we test every single touch point and option. And so if it's, you know, a single white paper, we look at the, you know, even if you only have 30,000 contacts, you might have 200,000 interactions. And so we test that yep. white paper against all the interactions and our statistical models can come back and say, okay, well, you've got this white paper, but we know that if we pull that white paper out of the model, statistically, it's probably not going to change anything. So even though a lot of people hit this white paper, we know that it's not really worth doing. And at the other end of the spectrum, you may have, well, only 10% of the group watches this video or receives this email, but like those folks always close. So that is, mm -hmm. you know, a legitimate point. And so, yeah, so we create the model monthly or quarterly. We just run the data and you basically get a map back of like, here's the marketing programs where they fall in the funnel too, which is cool. Instead of just saying, you know, it's binary, yes, no, win, loss. It's, 
well, the new business is all coming from your social media presence and the deals that are closing tend to be getting email newsletters and things like that. Like we see where things fall. And another thing we get to a point where you see that how much of a, a crutch is organic search, you know, cause we see some customers where like 80% of their traffic is coming from organic search. And well, that's great because that's almost free inbound traffic. But the thing with that is, you know, if something goes wrong with your pages or you start, you know, you get hit yeah. by an algorithm change, you're like, your business could be wiped yeah. out. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm kind of rambling on because there's so much going on with that, but that's the, you know, that that's our view of the world. Awesome. So I'm, I want to circle back to a few things that you, you hit on. Um, so one was just that example of, Hey, we thought they came in through the website, but it really was like somebody talked to me and, and told me I should try your product. Um, I actually, I had a conversation with Dr. James Oldroyd at, at BYU a couple of weeks ago, and we were looking at some data around what technologies people are using. We'd mapped it geographically. And we saw there's a huge trend towards if a company is located in a certain region, the adoption is probably going to be higher for them in that region as opposed to like, so somebody here, we're located in Utah, call it the Mountain West region. We're going to have higher adoption because we can just go down the street and, and talk to somebody, you know, or we may already know like, hey, my buddy works over here and call him up, see if it's a fit where somebody leaves us and, and goes to another place or they use us at somewhere and go somewhere else. Um, he's seeing that as a huge trend in other research he's doing as well, that just the idea of being close and, and human connection still very real in the sales and marketing world. Oh yeah. And that's, so we see that now in this huge wave of influencer marketing, you know, and there's a lot of stuff going on on that front. And in fact, we have a, a lot of research that we do on that front of, you know, you kind of hit these certain groups of people that are super spreaders. You know, there's yeah. certain uh, folks that, you know, like a Sean Zinsmeister and out of San Francisco, he's not out of San Francisco anymore, but he was out of the Bay Area. And he was like this cluster of MarTech people around him. And if yep. you tried a MarTech tool and it worked well, like suddenly you'd see it pop up in 25 other places over the next six months. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that, that, um, yeah, we're not really to that point. You know, we have it. People kind of underestimate in the past three years, there's been this huge boom in accuracy because now we're tracking mobile and on, you know, desktop, yep. which we couldn't be able to do. And so now being able to get that back together throws another huge pile of data into it. But yeah, then there sure. is always the, the influencer factor. And so that's how we suggest to go that route is make influencers one of your marketing programs. And, you know, then it will statistically show up if they're driving traffic, because usually the influencers will be, you know, pushing people to pricing and download pages. You know, you'll see them For go sure. right to the end of the cycle. And so we see conversions and depending on the um, climate too, affiliate might be something you might even want to look into. You know, there's sometimes you have people that are such influencers that you're willing to give them a cut of the sale because they yeah. can bring in so much traffic and so much action. No, for sure. My uh, my brother works for a real estate uh, software company, and they drive. I think he said sixty to seventy percent of their leads through affiliates. Mm -hmm. So he's like, "Yeah, that's that's what works, man." So um, okay. Now I want to ask you another question about attributions. So if uh, if somebody's just getting started, like you guys have a very complex uh, model, it sounds like that you're working with, which I love, but Let's just say new startup trying to figure out, OK, we want to track, you know, a, some attribution. Where do you what do you think is the best way to start? Like, is it a last touch, first touch, a little bit of a combination? Yeah, for starters, you know, Google Analytics has got some pretty good stuff out of the box. I mean, you can set up goals in there. It does. a, I think it's a 90 day window decay model. So, you know, it'll track everything that happens in 90 days, but it'll discount the older stuff. So that can get you, you know, in the door and running. And it's not even terribly expensive. I mean, yeah. we can do a GA model and a basic start for like 10 grand. You know, that's kind of which, you know, if you're a startup and you have no money, that's painful. But if you're considering, you know, hiring your first marketing hire versus having somebody just build that model for you and be able to point you which way to go, it's actually a lot cheaper to go that yeah, route. It is. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, 
pretty much set up Google Analytics, set up a set of goals. You know, you can get, I think it's 20 goals in GA out of the box with the basic edition, and that's free. And yeah. so that's enough to at least point you in the right, you know, right direction. And I think the huge lift with that is that as long as you set up your channels right, you know, you can see what your ads and social are doing. You know, you can kind of break out that traffic and get a feel for who's coming in the door and when they're coming. Um, and then, you know, I'm not as... I've been out of the affiliate game too long as a real player. You know, we have a, an affiliate program, but it's more of a partnership thing. But there's software on that front too, where you can set people up as affiliates and then you just give them a custom landing page for their purchases. And then so that'll show up over in GA also. So you, you can measure awesome. it all over there. Yeah, it's a good way to get started. Awesome. I love it. I love it. So the let's go, hit the last point, which I think is really the foundation for all of this data cleanliness. Um, <laughs> How we've all, I mean, not all of us, but anyone who's tried to figure out any data related answer for marketing and sales has probably had the, uh, the pleasure of realizing, man, the exports I'm getting from, you know, whatever program I'm pulling it out of, it's not been set up very well. I'm going to have to clean all of this up. Um, what are you guys seeing as, as problems that people can avoid and best practices with keeping your data clean? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we see in some situations that trying to get to a report or get to a model that 90% of the work is the building the data structure, cleaning the data, getting it to a point, especially when it's cross platform, you know, that's when you start to run into, you know, if you're trying to do an export from your email system and from your CRM system and get that stuff to reconcile. I mean, it's, it can be a ton of work. So, yeah, there's just a ton of labor into it. And this is another one where we kind of suggest that you should really check out the, you know, getting some professional help because, you know, why would you want to have to build scripts and all kinds of stuff to make, you know, three spreadsheets from three different systems work properly when somebody else has already done that work and can show up on day one and load your data and get it to work. Um, so, yeah, you have to kind of look long and hard about how much of it do you want to build and versus buy because, you know, do you really want to have a whole full-time equivalent that's like cleaning up spreadsheets and, you know, doing yeah. real grunt work? Um, so, yeah, there's a lot that, that goes into that. Um, but, yeah, it's really, you know, it, it's a huge challenge. I mean, documentation and compliance is a, a huge part of that. You know, as you're building and answering questions, keeping detailed records of all the steps and maybe even getting to the point where that gets scripted so that in the future you just drop the files into a folder and they, you know, get spit out in the outputs in the right format. So you're not spending all your, you know, you're just dealing with exceptions rather than, um, you know, uh, cleaning out all the, the spammy or not so hammy email yeah. domains and things like that. Like you can just have scripts, throw that stuff away. Um, but yeah, it's a ton of labor. It's, it's something that you want to document and hopefully automate to speed up in the future. Um, and then the other problem with that is, you know, the APIs change or the, the products change or the output reports change, you know, it's like at any time you could think you're there and next month you run the reports and it breaks because the, you know, output has changed on one of the systems because there's a new release of CRM soft or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's ongoing and challenging, but you know, the results are huge. I mean, we see across the board that it's like you can get a 20% lift for your whole enterprise if you've got this thing built and tuned right because it can just make such a huge difference in controlling your marketing spend and putting your money towards, you know, where it actually drives sales. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this, John, then. Um, what what platforms do you guys work with that, that you find are the best to work with? Um. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. There's there's kind of no best. There's a bunch of players that are all yeah. good for the right situations. But the ones that we see, you know, <clears throat> Google Analytics just dominates as far as web analytics right now because it's free to get started. So small orgs can do it. But it's got enough enterprise juice that it can work for midsize. And then you can, if you want to, you know, write a big, huge, fat enterprise level check, you can get GA360. And that's also pretty hardcore. Um, we see Adobe all over the place. That's another you know, real player in, in the marketing um, arena. And of course, Oracle's NetSuite is just yeah. great because it kind of, that's kind of, you know, enterprise grade, your whole, you know, you can get payroll and, uh, you know, all these other departments that normally marketing goes nowhere near. Um, other big player, you know, CRM is, is there's just such a battle going on there between like Salesforce and HubSpot and, um, yeah. you know, a few other players. And so it's just a matter of, 
Uh, a lot of them even now are coming to the place where it's kind of like if you're in that Salesforce ecosystem, it's hard to make an argument to get out of it, you know, because it's pretty much like anybody worth a dime is going to integrate to Salesforce. Um, For sure. So there's that. But we see HubSpot all over the place, too, because they've done a great job of, you know, uh, making it affordable for small organizations. And they've got a lot of neat functions um, over on the marketing side, too. You know, that was kind of where they got their start, but they've really made a hard push to CRM. Um, so, yeah, those are the the major play. A couple email service providers, you know, we see Marketo all over the place. Um, Eloquo's yeah. eaten up by Oracle, but it's still around. So, that yeah, those are kind of the major folks we we tend to see in the in the game cool okay man well before i let you go i want to ask you is there anything that i should have asked you that i didn't you know you're thinking man if billy was smart he would have asked me this question no no you hit most of the big big guns um because you know yeah that's it it's data cleanliness attribution and and predictive are the big things um the only other stuff that we see um you know the influencing thing we touched on for a minute is is huge because we've done a lot of stuff as far as, you know, not looking at who has the most likes or who has the most followers, but analyzing the actual traffic and see who's being talked about because that's where you yeah. really find the influencers. And so we've seen a lot of opportunities for companies instead of getting, you know, the person that has 4 million followers and wants 20 grand to do something. If you dig into the data, you're going to find these people that are down at like the 70% mark. You know, maybe they only have a thousand or 2000 followers, but for some reason, when these people post something, that's when all the million follower people jump on it. Like they're the ones that the trend makers are watching. And Ooh. so um, trying to find those folks who can move the needle for you, there's a, there's a lot of money there. And then SEO too, we didn't really talk much about that, but SEO is just, you know, money on the table for almost every company. I mean, you can, if you create a good blog, you can get some inbound SEO traffic and it costs, you know, as close to zero as you're going to get for marketing campaigns. So. Awesome. And those just, I mean, we've got blog posts from two years ago that still drive visits every week and not just a handful, like a lot of visits. And I'm, I'm just <laughs> amazed. I'm like, okay, like this was a good, this was a hit. So. Yeah. It's nuts. I mean, I remember, so I was working at a, a company that had a software development tool and we had a white paper that ran for like seven years. I mean, it was just, here's how you handle this chunk of the software development process. And it was pretty much the only paper out there on that. And so it was just every month, there'd be 30 leads coming in from that. And, you know, we spent like two grand to write it the first year and we got seven years of leads out of it. So it's, yeah, yeah if you can find your niche and write, publish some great content, it's, uh, you're not going to be able to beat that for return. I, I agree. When I was working at Inside Sales, they did a research study on lead response and man, they, they still, I saw it on LinkedIn yesterday. They were still pulling data out of this and, and promoting it. And I was like, wow, okay, this one just keeps on giving. And that's over 10 years old. So we, no, I hadn't even thought of that too. You're in Utah. We, you didn't mention inside sales. I have done yeah. a ton. Yeah. Were you there? Was Todd Grierson there when you were working there? I, I know Todd Grierson, not really well. We didn't overlap a lot, but yeah, he was there a little while while I was there. Oh, okay. That's funny. Yeah, the, the, people don't need to hear the behind the show <laughs> patter, but yeah, because I did a bunch of stuff that we used to do. The American Association of Inside Sales. You talk yeah. about a hardcore uh, oh, yeah. group of people that was, had some good events with them, and that's a, a cool niche. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay, man. Well, with that, um, I think we'll wrap it up. If people, you know, I would encourage everyone check out Marketing Over Coffee. Um, it's great. There's a reason it's been around forever. Um, but if people want to contact you and continue the conversation, John, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah. Marketingovercoffee.com is fine. There's links there that go to every place else or, um, at John J wall on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn. You can hook up with me over there. Um, I'm easy to get a hold of. Okay. We'll chat later, man. Thank you again. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate it.